kind of a challenge I would have to anybody who watches the Is Genesis History movie. When one side presents their argument, it sounds compelling mm -hmm. until somebody comes and cross-examines them. Mm -hmm. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back. Today we're going to be visiting with Del Tackett and Robert Carter, Ph.D. Dr. Carter obtained a Bachelor of Science in Applied Biology from the Georgia Institute of Technology in 1992. He then spent four years teaching high school biology, chemistry, physics, and electronics before going on to the University of Miami to obtain his Ph.D. in Marine Biology. He successfully completed this program in 2003. Well, that's enough in the way of introductions. Let's see what they have to say. Rob Carter is a marine biologist. So he took me scuba diving to get a glimpse of a world most people don't see. His specialty is coral, and he knew a lot about the incredible creatures that inhabit the reefs around St. Thomas. Oh man, we've got sharks here. I mean, just look at how they move. It's almost like they effortlessly glide along. I wish I could swim like that. Engineers wish we could make boats like that. Submarines that could move as efficiently as a shark. We can't quite do it. Okay, 40 seconds of filler conversation. Not as bad as it could have been, I suppose. So, from your perspective as a marine biologist, and I know that you've studied the whole area of genetics a lot, when people talk about evolution, what is it? Evolution is quite simply the change in genetic composition of a population over successive generations, which may be caused by natural selection, inbreeding, hybridization, or mutation. Now, let's see how Dr. Carter defines it. How to define evolution? The word means change over time. But I believe in change over time, but I'm not an evolutionist. So how does one figure this out? Really, evolution is a belief that enough change over time, over enough time, can lead to the common ancestry of all species on Earth. And the distortions start already. Evolution is not a belief. Evolution is a fact. It has occurred. Alright. So that's the part I reject. I mean, of course species change. I mean, look at these sharks here. We have several different species of sharks. When God created, he put into those organisms the ability to change, to adapt, to respond dynamically to the environment. But they're still sharks. And when we look at the fossil record, they're still sharks. Of course they're still sharks, just as humans are still apes. If they were not, the theory of evolution would be falsified. People have heard the phrase, the missing link, and they usually think between man and monkeys, but there's missing links between almost every major group of animals and almost every other group of animal, plant, and bacteria throughout the entire fossil record. People may have heard the phrase, the missing link, but it's hardly useful in the study of the theory of evolution. The term transitional form or transitional species is much more useful and accurate. Transitional forms occur between what was and what is, and have characteristics of both. Unfortunately, no matter how many transitional forms we collect from the fossil record, the creationist will always demand one more, the missing link. Which indicates very strongly that these are actually different creations. So we don't get one kind becoming another kind. This is just a repetition of their dogs don't become cats argument using different words. The creationists know very well that the theory of evolution does not claim that dogs will become cats or one kind will become another kind. If this ever did happen, once again, the theory of evolution would be falsified. No. Evolutionary theory requires that small random changes can explain everything we see, but it can't. 
And why can't it? Because life is so complex that small changes can't explain it. Just like you can't take a computer operating system and say, Look, this is built up one digit at a time, over any length of time. No, it took an intelligent person to sit down and put it together. Well, I can guarantee you, as one that was in that world, that if anyone in the area of computer science were to say, if we just randomly change some things in this operating system, it'll get better, no one would agree with that. Well, two problems in that last exchange. First, the argument that a long series of small changes cannot result in complexity is asserted without evidence. Second, a false analogy is employed in that a life form or DNA molecule cannot be compared to a computer program or operating system. If a segment of a functional computer program is disabled, the program will experience an exception or fault, whereas there are many segments of a DNA strand that are permanently disabled. Another flaw in this false analogy is that biological evolution occurs in populations, not individuals. Randomly changing the operating system of a computer affects a population size of one. We're not going to get the shark to evolve into a bird. The number of changes, and the types of changes, are not something you can do one change at a time. Sharks to birds? This is just another restatement of the dogs to cats or one kind to another kind straw man argument. This is a sea urchin. It's pointy. You gotta be careful. Am I gonna get stuck if I touch it? No, no, no. He's pointy, but... Oh my goodness! They're moving! Yes, they're moving. And in between those spines are little tube feet. Especially on the bottom. Look at that movement. So he walks with his spines, but he has little tube feet in here. And that's what he uses to grab onto things. But looking carefully, there are actually ten radial parts to this animal. Actually, the starfish is its cousin. Are you serious? You can't be serious. Absolutely. The starfish here is also an echinoderm. But notice he has five-fold symmetry instead of ten. On the bottom, look, we see spines. We see the tube feet. His mouth is in the center there. So, there is some similarity here. Even though externally it looks a lot different. You want to see something that looks totally different? That's a cousin to the starfish and the sea urchin? All right. Hmm, it almost looks like a rock. Yes, he does. I gotta be careful. He'll squirt on me. You mean like a priest? This is a sea cucumber. He has spines. He has tube feet. You'd never know it until you studied really hard that this is also an echinoderm. He's not very happy being out of the water, so let me put him back in. So these are all related? Even though they look very, very different? Come on, Dell. Make the leap. Recognize common ancestry. Related in their creation. Ah, shit. Not in an evolutionary sense, but our creator took this phylum of life, echinoderms, and created this, and this, and this, on a similar pattern. And that's what we see across the entire realm of life. Similarities and differences. Oh? I thought that the kinds on the fictional arc speciated like lightning into the variety of related land animals we see today. So that is all true. But for related sea animals, completely different. Why is your story good for sea cucumbers, but not for the finches? Guys, you don't even have internal consistency in your arguments. So what makes them different? Well, genetically, they share most of their genes in common. But there are developmental genes, they're called Hox genes, that set up these patterns in the animal as it develops. They develop from a single cell, and in one of them it sets up a five-fold symmetry. 
In another, they set up a tenfold symmetry. In another, they make a long, skinny animal. They control the development of the embryo in these amazing ways. So what you're saying is that when we look at this from a molecular or a genetic perspective, what we're finding is really a fascinating design in all of this. Well, he is trying to argue for design, but he's doing a pretty poor job of it. Absolutely. Glad you agree, Rob. But what we've heard, in the conventional paradigm, the conventional story tells us that it's those random changes that have brought about all of this. Sure. Back in the 1800s, when life was simple, when they didn't know what was happening inside the cell, they didn't know how complex genetics was, you could imagine all sorts of things. But now that we actually know what happens behind the scenes, the story gets a lot more complicated. You see, I'd like to say the genome is four-dimensional. Okay, I'm going to summarize the next segment for all of you, because it's basically word salad. I'll provide a link to Carter's paper on the subject in the description. In an attempt to dumb it down for his target audience, basically inane paper becomes incomprehensible. You heard him say that he likes to say that the genome is four-dimensional. Wait till you hear what those dimensions are. Dimension 1. All the letters corresponding to the base pairs in the DNA strand, written out. Dimension 2. A bunch of arrows between various sections of the series of written letters. This is because different parts of the DNA strand work in concert with other parts, or activate or deactivate other parts. At this point, Dell makes another false analogy to a computer program, one that rewrites itself. DNA is not a computer program, and it's certainly not rewriting itself. Dimension 3 the folding of the genome into a three-dimensional form. Dimension 4. Time. I kid you not, this, this is what he said. This is an accurate description of his four dimensions as stated in a full, single-spaced page of Babel. Rob, that's so far beyond anything that we know even in our most complex software systems, that it's almost beyond imagination to think that someone would look at that and say it all happened by chance. Hmm, that's a tough one. I'm not sure if that's an argument from ignorance or an argument from incredulity. Definitely one of those two, though. Yes, and it only brings glory to God. It does. You can't build something like that one thing at a time. You need it to function in all its interlocking four-dimensional complexities. It's not something you can do one letter at a time with natural selection. It all has to be there. This sounds like the old irreducible complexity argument. Of what use is half an eye, they say. I say go ask a flatworm. They have the most primitive eyes I know of. It's just two light-sensitive patches on their head. Yes, in the same way we talked about the environment out here on the coral reef, if you don't have all these interlocking pieces of that puzzle, you don't have that ecology. The system will come crashing down if you remove just a couple of the very important factors. They have to be together, or it doesn't happen. So not only did we have this interdependency, this mutualism, so to speak, down at the genetic level, now we even make it more complex by saying that there's that same mutualism at the higher level. Yes, in fact, the entire world has a mutualism. Making reference to the reef now. I guess when they scuttle a ship to form an artificial reef, 
they dump in all the life forms, uh, fish, crustaceans, bacteria, that live on an existing reef. Sounds like they're saying it all has to show up on day one. Or day five, depending on your choice of magic book. It's impossible to think that all of this could have happened just by a series of slow processes over billions of years. This is what I'm saying. It's clear that the world we live in is incredibly interdependent. From the smallest biological system to the largest ecosystem. There are complex and mutual relationships everywhere. I realize that creation in six days makes the most sense from an engineering perspective. You need everything working together at the same time for everything to function properly. And that's exactly how Genesis says God created it. Well, there it is. Good old Dell has expanded the long debunked irreducible complexity argument to include the entire Earth. Rob also said God created animals with the ability to change and adapt to their environments. Is it possible that his ability to change has been mistaken for evolution? Okay, look, Dell. I feel a little sorry for you, so how's this sound? We don't have a 100% solid theory for abiogenesis yet. So, if it'll make you feel better, you're allowed to believe that your invisible man in the sky gave that ability to change to a few newly created single-celled life forms about 3.8 billion years ago. Deal? That way everybody's happy. Well, that about wraps up this episode. Thanks for watching. The next exciting episode will be on Polygia's channel, so please make sure you're subscribed there. Also, if you haven't already, please subscribe here. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.